welcome to the Hall of Wisdom. I am so godly grateful that you tune in on today. I am so excited to see your faces in the place. Oh, yes, I am. Listen, it marked two years this month that our very beloved Bishop Stephen B. Hall went home to be with the Lord. And sometimes it still seems like yesterday for me, and I'm sure it feels like that to you. But the wonderful thing is, uh, over 40 years, Bishop uh, made memories and he loved what he did, loved preaching the word of God and love God people. And today you get to experience that love that he shared from the pulpit in his singing and also through the word of God. So I want you to go ahead and at least tag 10 people, tell them we're on and come on and let's enjoy this first Saturday together. And I will be back in a moment. God bless you. pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land and sat and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship now when he had left speaking he said unto simon launch out into the deep and let down your net for a drought and simon answering said unto him master we have toiled all night all the night and have taken nothing nevertheless at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, uh, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both of the ships, so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of fishes which they had taken the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. I want to attack this text as the Lord shall give power to preach uh, from what might be a strange tag. Um, but I want to talk about starting your impossible or start your impossible. Just look at your neighbor. I know it don't make a whole lot of sense, but tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor we're talking about starting your impossible. Starting your impossible. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And certainly I don't want to say one other word without thanking God for the pastor of this great church. Yes, Lord. Yeah. I have incredible respect for Bishop Pierce and thank God for he and his lovely wife and thank this church for being so hospitable. Amen. My armor bearer that, uh, that shared with us tonight uh, that me and my first assistant, Pastor Dawson, he should give classes on armor bearing. I mean, he, he is for real. He's a real deal. Amen. So I did whatever he told me to do. Amen. Starting your impossible. Starting your impossible. My brothers and sisters, I think that I should tell you that I am a great fan of cinematography. I love cinematography on many different levels. There are those who enjoy cinematography as it relates to movies. Others enjoy cinematography as it relates to uh, different shows or what have you. But one of my most favorite forms of cinematography is commercials. I love commercials love commercials. And if you are a fan of cinematography, more particularly commercials, then you know that the one day of the year that you cannot be MIA, missing in action, 
is Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday is when some of the greatest and funniest and even great failures of uh, uh, commercials are seen and viewed. And when I was looking at what was an incredible football game on Sunday, uh, and I looked at all of the commercials, uh, one of the commercials that robbed my attention immediately was a commercial given by the Toyota Corporation. And you will discover that they have started an ad campaign that simply entitled, Starred, You're Impossible. This ad campaign really takes full swing come next week on the 9th of February, but they've already started putting uh, commercials on the screen. The reason why they call these commercials start, you're impossible, because it has now become the new mantra and the new marching orders for Toyota. As a result of this campaign, this campaign started because Toyota is now the worldwide mobility partner for the Olympics. So they have all of the mobility uh, things that happens in the Olympics. Toyota is in charge of it. The owner of Toyota said that the reason why he wanted to use this starred you're impossible because he hates when anybody tells him he can't do something. As a matter of fact, he takes it as a challenge. And as a result of taking it at a challenge, many of the things that he have accomplished in life is because someone told him it was impossible. I've come to tell you brothers and sisters, when I heard this, something stood up in my spirit because I've come to understand that as the children of the Most High God, as the people of God, we should have the same dogmatic disposition as it relates to what seems to be impossible. I believe that whenever someone tells a child of God that something is impossible, we ought to have a greater, greater level of intensity than even the CEO of Toyota. Because after all, his intensity was only geared because of his personal belief, because what he believes about himself. But we ought to have this intensity because not only do we believe in ourselves, but we have been given the word of God. You do remember, you do remember, you do remember when God was ready uh, to give Abraham a son and the Bible says that his wife was eavesdropping on the conversation. And when she was eavesdropping on the conversation and the Lord told him that she was going to have a child, the Bible says that she couldn't hold it in any longer. She started laughing. And the Lord had to ask Abram, he says, why is your wife laughing? He says, I want to know something right here and right now, Abraham. Is there anything too hard for God? And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you're waiting to hear what the score is going to be in just a few minutes. But, but I think I ought to tell you while you're waiting on the score, I need to ask those of you who have gathered in this sacred space and who have filled these chairs to Ask you is there anything too hard for God and if there is nothing too hard for God how is it that you allow things and allow the voice of the enemy and allow the plot and plans of the enemy to stop you from doing something impossible as a, as a matter of fact, can I, can I pause parenthetically to ask you this question? When was the last time you did something impossible? When, when was the last time you stepped out of the ordinary and did something extraordinary? When was the last time you did something that was not comfortable to do, but it took something on the inside of you being stirred and it took your having a dogmatic disposition to do it? When was the last time you did the impossible? Well, I've come to share tonight brothers and sisters that when I saw that commercial, I said to myself, there is no way that the world is going to say to me that they are starting that impossible and I not start mine. Matter of fact, when you lean over, I know it's flu season, so don't lean over and shake hands, but lean over and look at somebody and tell them I'm starting my impossible. 
And when you look at the text, the text is tell it to testify that you can start your impossible. As a matter of fact, this text screams the impossible being done. <laughs> I said this text screams the impossible being done. And here's what I believe in my heart and made up in my mind and then I go to point number one. I have learned how to read the Bible with this type, type of attitude. I've learned how to read the Bible and say to myself, if he did it for them, he's got to do it for me. Okay, 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 okay. I came to have church. I'll do it by myself, but it's just better when we do it together. Look, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I feel the same way tonight. If he did it for them, he's got to do it for me. Because for you to have any other thought process is to suggest that you think God loves them more than he loves you. You think that God will do more for somebody else than he will do for you. I don't know about the rest of y'all. I, 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 I live my life like I'm his favorite child. Okay, look at somebody tell them that's how I'm living my life from now on. Like I'm his favorite child. What you mean by that? If you're the favorite child, this is how you think. If anybody's going to get a car, it's going to be me. If anybody's going to get a house, it's going to be me. If anybody's body's going to get healed, it's going to be me. If he's going to perform a miracle, it's going to be me. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe some of you don't believe in miracles anymore. But I wish I could find about 2.5 person in this room who could just lean over and tap your neighbor with your elbow and tell them I still believe in miracle okay tap them with your elbow don't tap them with your hand tap them with your elbow tell them I still believe in miracles I believe in miracles why do you believe in miracles here's why I believe in miracles uh Stephon Brown I believe in miracles because I said to myself I would rather believe in miracles and not need one than to need one and not believe it I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. Okay, come on. Sit down. We, we, we almost there. Here it is. Here it is. So when we look at the text, the text says that all of us can roll out of this room starting our impossible. That, that's, why you, that's, why, that's why you got to have stuff like vision boards and all that. Because vision boards make the impossible possible. You get it? You get it? Okay, so, so here it is. So, so if, 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 if I'm going to start my impossible, what does the text say about me doing that? When, when I look at the text, the text gives two steps that we must make. And Jesus will take it from there. <laughs> I said the text says there were two steps that we must make. And Jesus will take it from there. Now, 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 there's a problem. There, there is a danger in saying that kind of thing in a room full of theologians. And, 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 and I know, I know, I know exactly what I'm dealing with. And I know you have a command for this particular pericope. And so therefore, you are waiting on me to make some kind of exegetical mistake. And so you, you're waiting on me to say something wrong. So let, let me just tell you up front. I, I know you know this text upside down, inside and out. And you already have your sermon notes for the text but but since I got the mic let me tell you what I see and uh, uh, when you get the mic you tell us what you see okay okay here, here it is Here's, here it is if I'm going to start my impossible I've got to start just as the pericope starts, when I, when I read this particular text, I understand that there was something that happens in, in verse uh, uh, number two, uh, uh, really in verse number three, that is overlooked, which leads me to my first point. If you are going to start your impossible, first of all, that has got to be what I'd like to call reassigned resources reassigned resources come on say that water your mouth with that with me come on tell your neighbor reassign resources 
You said, uh, why, why, why do you say that? Because when you look at the text, the first thing that you will discover is that verse number one, verse number one, verse number one, verse number one tells us where we are and what's uh, happening where we are. Verse number one tells us that Jesus is now at the lake of Gennesaret and he is preaching the word. Uh, verse number two tells us what happens, uh, uh, y'all get it, that verse number two tells us what happens and how all of this take place. Uh, it, says, it says that there were two fishermen uh, who were washing their nets, who were washing their nets, who were washing their nets after having fished all night long. They were washing their nets. And the Bible says, watch this, the Bible says in verse number three, it starts by saying, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon, and watch this, and prayed him uh, that he would thrust out a little from the land. Now, let me put that in plain English. He, 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 he gets in the boat because he's getting ready to preach. He gets in the boat and uses the boat as a pulpit. Okay, okay. Okay. uses the boat as a pulpit he uses the boat as a pulpit which helps me to understand that some of the things that we have made sacred over the years is not sacred as much as it is just a tool to do ministry <laughs> okay okay see if y'all said amen let me, let me give you let me give you some pointers if you said amen right there real good I'd have been on but since you didn't say amen real good now I gotta explain what I just said here it is, here it is. I remember when I was a little boy, I remember when I was a little boy, I remember when I was a little boy, Brooks, one of the worst whippings that I ever got in my life, Bishop, was I was playing in the pulpit of my daddy's church after church. Oh no, you don't, do, no, not in a good uh, missionary Baptist church. You don't play in the pulpit. The pulpit is sacred. Don't play in the pulpit. But what people don't realize is that what this is, this is just something to help us do ministry. Because God never intended for the space to be sacred. He intended for the specimen to be sacred. He gets in the boat. Now watch this. And you cannot not call it a boat just because he's preaching out of it. <laughs> it's still a boat. He's just using it. And if you'd say it, amen a little better right there, I could have gone on. I wouldn't have to tell you that I get excited when I look at that fact, which says to me that Jesus can use something that ain't churchy at all and use it for the glory of God. Okay, okay, watch this. So he gets in the boat. Bible says when he gets in the boat, he tells the captain of the boat, push this boat out a little bit. Okay, see what you saw was, and he got in there and prayed and said, um, uh, push it out. You, you, no, no, he, he got in there and said, push the boat out. Push the boat out. What you miss in the text is, he never once asked Peter, can I use your boat? He never says, uh, is it all right if I use your boat? He gets in the boat, and then when he gets in the boat, he has a take charge disposition and say, push the boat out. Now, now here's what's incredible in the text. What's incredible in the text is that you and I were not there which made the text go the way it should have gone. Because come closer, if some church people had been there, this text would have been messed all the way up. Because you would have been in there attitudinal talking about, first of all, what you doing in my boat? Ain't nobody told you to get in my boat. And if you, since you in my boat, you going to have the audacity to tell me to push my boat out. What you can do is get yourself out my boat. And now we would have missed everything from verse 3 on down. But because the Bible says, watch this, that when he says to Peter, push the boat out a little. Peter, you know what Peter did? He pushed the boat out. You said, well, I, I still don't get point number one. You said your point was 
that there has to be reassigned resources. Here's what you miss. What you miss is that this was not like your boat in your backyard. Your boat in your backyard that you hooked to your Ford F-150 and go to Florida every so many times a year to fish, that boat is a pleasure boat. The boat that he was standing in with Peter was a boat that he earned his living with. This was the boat that he used for his resources. Now watch this, watch this. There are two things that I noticed about Peter in this, in this whole uh, point number one. I wrote in my notes, here's what I wrote in my notes. I wrote in my notes, what was remarkable about Peter was number one, his cordial, his cordial countenance. His cordial countenance. You see, he, Peter was nice. Jesus said, let, Jesus said, let's push the boat out. He pushed his boat out. Jesus, and, and we hear nothing else from Peter. But what makes his cordial countenance even, even more remarkable is that his cordial your countenance comes on the heel of corporate catastrophe because the Bible says that Peter is nice but he had a bad night which helps me to know that he's a whole lot of different he's a whole lot more different than some of the folk I see in church because some of the folk I see in church if they have a bad night everybody in trouble He is nice, even though he's had a bad night. You said, what happened? The Bible says that these fishermen, when Jesus meet them, they are standing out there washing their nets, which has got to be one of the most frustrating acts in the world. Because the reason why they're washing their nets is that their nets were used to catch boat, catch fish. But they were washing their nets, which is not something unusual. It is usual for them to wash their nets. But usually what they're washing their nets from is from all of the debris that came with all of the fish that they caught. But they're washing their nets and they're washing nets that caught nothing. So they got to go through the process even though they don't get the prize. They're washing their nets. So, so he has failed as a businessman. Jesus uses his boat, which means that now, even on the heels of failure, he reassigns his resources. Can I submit to you that maybe one of the reasons that you have not done the impossible is that your resources are in the wrong hands. In his hands, his resources failed. In his hands, his resources failed. Now, had you said amen, I'd have gone on to the next thing. But since you didn't, it's because you wanted me to tell you that maybe the reason why you are scuffling and maybe the reason why you are robbing Peter to pay Paul is because you haven't paid Jesus. And could it be that your resources are in the wrong hands? And resources in the wrong hands equals failure. I've made up in my mind that if no one else gets paid, Jesus is going to get paid. Oh, no, 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 no. You read that sentence wrong because you read that sentence and heard it with a question mark. I said it with an exclamation point. I said, if nobody else get paid, Jesus is going to get paid. Ask me why. Glad you asked because I have discovered that if I pay Jesus, everybody else gets paid. Okay, so, so, so if you're going to do the impossible, you got to reassign your resources. But then secondly, if you are going to do the impossible, you have got to have what I call a radical response. Radical response. Radical response. What's the radical response? The radical response is... Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net for a drought. Have you ever thought about reading it this way? 
Because when you read it this way, it makes more sense to you. Because you have no nets, you have no boats, you're not trying to fish. So this wouldn't speak volumes to someone who has no nets, who have no boat, who's not trying to fish. Nevertheless, at thy word, I let down the net for a drought. But this will make a whole lot of sense to you. Look at it, nevertheless. And when you look at nevertheless and read to the end of the sentence, if you remove the last four words, it'll make better sense to you. Because when you remove the last four words, which is let down the net, here's what it would read like. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will. Ne nevertheless, at thy word, I will. Now, 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 I hear you thinking, this room full of preachers, you said, yeah, man, you're doing all right, but you forgot something. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you think I forgot something, but I'm just using my deceased brother's approach. My brother, Mark, he, when he would preach, he would always backdoor a text. He'd say, I'm coming through the back door and run all the way back to the front and grab everything I see going. So my brother, he would do it this way. He, he would talk about the radical response because he would have you sitting there and wondering, well, why are you dealing with the radical response? Wasn't there something before that? Yeah, but the something before that had nothing to do with you. We're dealing with your part in, in making the impossible possible. So what you really want me to talk about, you say, well, what comes before the radical, ra radical response? What comes before the radical response is a ridiculous request. See, that's, that's a ridiculous request. Je Jesus, Jesus, who is omniscient, by the way, omniscient means he knows all things. He knows that these fellas have been fishing all night and have failed at their fishing expedition. And while he knows that they have failed, Jesus tells them, launch out into the deep and let down your neck for a drought. And they start telling Jesus, now wait a minute, Jesus, I've been cordial all of this time. He says, but we have toiled all night, which means what you're telling us to do is a ridiculous request. First of all, we have already been out there. That's the first thing. Second of all, it's not the right time to be out there. You don't catch fish in the day. You catch fish in the night. It's ridiculous, but that's what I love about God. He's always making ridiculous requests. Y'all ain't happy. He's always making ridiculous requests. He tells us to do things because it sounds ridiculous, but God moves in the ridiculous. Y'all ain't happy. Y'all ain't happy. Y'all ain't happy. Will you tap somebody and tell your neighbor he moves in the ridiculous? I mean, when you say something like if someone hits you on one cheek, turn to them the other from the place that I grew up. I grew up in the hood. And in the hood, that's ridiculous. Tell somebody that's already having a shortage in money to bring me a dime out of every dollar. That's ridiculous. But God moves in the ridiculous. He makes a ridiculous request. He says, launch out into the deep. Let down your net for a drought. First of all, he says, um, move from where you are to where you need to be. Can I submit to some of you that you are going to have to get away from the shore if you're going to do the impossible. And you're going to have to get away from shore dwellers if you're going to do the impossible. See, the problem with some of you, the reason why you can't do the impossible is because all of the people that's around you try to keep you tied to the possible. They try to keep you the stuff that's already been conquered. <laughs> They want you to do safe stuff. But look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, this is not the season of your life to be playing it safe. You got to do some unsafe 
uncanny. You got to do some stuff that don't make sense to nobody but you and Jesus. Some of you pastors that's in this room right now, this is not the first church you pastor. You left a very established church, started a church just because Jesus told you to do it and it didn't make sense to anybody else. But you know even in the days that it was hard that you knew God told you to do it. And so since he told you to do it, you just made up in your mind, I'm going to give a radical response to his ridiculous request. All right, I'm done. So here it is. He makes a ridiculous request, but more importantly, Peter makes a radical response. You said, why more importantly? Because Jesus is always making ridiculous requests. But there's no, that's not a whole lot of people that's making radical responses. And here's the last thing before I leave this point. Um... You should have been asking me, because we're preaching this together. You should have been asking me, not just about Jesus' ridiculous request. You should, have, you should have been asking me, not just about Peter's radical response. But what you should have been asking me is, hey, man, why did they fail in the first place? Okay, because if you look at why they failed in the first place, Pastor Pierce, it's going to mess up a whole lot of church folk. Because the lies you've been telling folk all these years will now not hold water. You know, you know how every time somebody is going through a hardship in their, in your, in their life and the saints and, and the smoke them over committee will always come up with the idea... That the reason why they're going through and having a hard time is because they are out of the will of God. And they're doing something they shouldn't, they have, they're doing something they shouldn't have done. And they're in the wrong place. And so now they are just reaping being in the wrong place, doing the wrong things. But when I look at this text, this text helped me to understand that church folk are sometimes full of it. Because if you really ask me why did they fail, none of the answers that you would normally give fits right here. Because your answer is they failed because they didn't know what they were doing. Wrong. They were skilled mariners. They may not have known how to be disciples, but they knew how to be fishermen. So they knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. You said, well, maybe they were on the, they were in somewhere they, they were not used to. This is the lake that they were normally fishing in. They knew how to fish in this lake. They were skilled. They were professionals. They knew what to do. They had all of the know-how for this moment in their life. But watch this. You said, well, maybe they were there at the wrong time of the day. He just told you we were there at the right time. We were there all night and caught nothing so why did they fail bishop I'm glad you asked I'm glad you asked they failed for the same reason you fail sometimes some of y'all right now live in failure and can't figure it out I pay my tithes. I live right. I treat folk right. I do this. I do the other. Why am I failing? Because your problem is you are so busy looking at fish that you don't understand. They didn't fail because of fish. They, say they failed because of future. So what do you mean by that? This failure is ordained failure. And the problem with some of y'all, you're going to you're gonna have to go home tonight when you get in that hotel room and, 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 and repent because what you were ready to say is that what you always say when you can't give, give explanation to something, the devil was busy. Can I submit to you that in the text, the devil has nothing to do with failure? Can I submit to you that this was God-ordained failure? Because the devil couldn't stop the fish from coming. Because the devil don't control the fish. 
So the only somebody that can stop the fish from coming is the one that controls the fish. And the one that controls the fish is God. He stopped the fish from coming because he wanted to give Peter and the boys more than just fish. He wanted to give them faith because fish can't fix the future, but faith can. I wish I had three people, but since I don't, I'm closing anyway. I wish I had a couple of people that could nudge your neighbor with your clothes elbow and tell your neighbor, I, I may not have a whole lot of fish, but you can't beat me having faith. Uh, wrong neighbor that neighbor is still looking for fish I wish you find another neighbor and tell your neighbor I may not have a whole lot of fish let's go Chris I'm, I'm done tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor that uh, I may not this is alright in the past I may not have a whole lot of fish but uh, one thing I do have, I have uh, a whole lot of faith. And is there anybody? Yes, Lord, uh, on your row. Uh, that is the captain of the team uh, when it comes to having faith. Uh, yeah, because uh, what they understand is that uh, when you have faith faith will get some fish yeah but uh, when you don't have faith you don't have faith and you can't get fish but uh, I wish I could find about three people who could tell your role I want you to know that the faith I have is getting ready to go sick me some fish y'all happy because uh, I the Bible say that uh, he told them launch out into the deep and let down your net for a drought he argued his point we've been fishing all night long but somewhere between explanation he had an experience because his experience said I got faith I just saw your teach I just heard to preach and at that word I will y'all ain't happy look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor that's why I came to the summit not so I could get fish so that my faith would be increased so when I get back home and I need some fish I can tell the Lord I toiled all night and I call nothing and then say excuse me Jesus I'm talking too much nevertheless out of your word I will and I got to get out of here because here's what I've discovered I've discovered that reassign resources and a radical response would lead to what I'd like to call a remarkable a remarkable result look at somebody and tell them I'm getting ready to have remarkable results now come on tell them and if they look like they don't believe you get your pocketbook get your Bible and move to another section and when you get to that section tell those people I'm getting ready to have remarkable results and if they look like they don't believe you move to another section because I came to tell y'all that 2018 for me is going to be the year of revival renewal and restoration as a matter of fact if I had to put it all in one word 2018 is going to be the year of the remarkable I dare you to testify up and down your road and 
tell your name this is the year of the remarkable this is the year I do everything they said I couldn't do this is the year I go back to school this is the year I get the degree this is the year even though I don't think I'll find a wife this is the year I find my true mate this is the year here's what I want you to do I want somebody in here that needs something impossible to go testify to about seven people and tell them this is my year of the remarkable and tell them one thing that you believe that God's gonna do that can't nobody else do y'all ain't happy tell them one thing he's gonna do that can't nobody else do tell your neighbor yes Lord tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow sometimes I didn't know right from wrong but in those lonely hours those precious lonely hours my God came to let me know that I'm his own and here's what I say now I thank him for the mountains I thank him for the valley I thank him Cause if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. But through it all, Say, I got faith. If you got faith, let me hear you. Say, I, say, I, yeah. Woo! I got faith. I told you you would be blessed by the word from our very beloved Bishop Stephen B. Hall. What I need you to do is to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can watch these videos and the word of God played over and over again. Go ahead and do that and be blessed and we will see you next month. God bless you.